It's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Mr. William Stern. We're here in Jerusalem. And um, Mr. Stern, can you mention a little bit about where you were born and uh, a little bit of a history? I was born in July 1935 in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, we led a normal, what is known in Yiddish as a Balbatish life, which means an upper middle class life. My late father, Zichron Oliveracha, was a textile manufacturer who managed a factory which delivered textile goods to the Hungarian state. And that became terribly important because in that role, when the Germans invaded Hungary on the 19th of March 1944, he was freed from the obligation to live in the ghetto and he was able to help a large number of Polish refugees who had come to Hungary in 1942 and 43 with Parnassá because of the fact that he was a manufacturer of textiles at a time when the anti-Jewish laws which Hungary enacted already in 1939 put a great many Jewish textile retailers out of business. Uh, I led a normal life of a schoolboy attending school until 1944. Uh, we had a comfortable life, large apartment, and on Shabbatot very many guests in 42 and 43, which I remember, a great many Polish refugees who were our guests on Shabbat. I should add that although I consider myself as a Hungarian-born Jew. It is uh, skin deep only in that my late father, Lechon Aurecha, was himself Polish-born. He came as a boy of 13 to Hungary when his father, uh, who had deserted the Russian army, uh, fled uh, into Hungary in order to avoid the consequences of a possible Russian occupation of Poland. Uh, I remember distinctly Sunday the 19th of March 44 because in terms of a little boy seeing the world I didn't understand what Nazi occupation meant but I did understand that my father said we must leave the house immediately if not he will be arrested because he was one of the prominent members of the community and I remember for a week I slept on the sofa of some friend of the family until he felt it was safe to return. The next thing I remember is late June 1944 when we assembled in order to board the train which became known as a Kastner train. It was a cattle train which took uh, a few days to reach Bergen-Belsen. We were stopped in Moshomoyarovan which is on the Hungarian border uh, with Germany and uh, with Austria, I should say, excuse me. Uh, and I remember that distinctly because we left, I think, June 30th on Budapest. My birthday is July 2nd, and we celebrated my ninth birthday in the fields of Moshomoyarova, where I became, as a kid, brought up in a normal home in a city, became aware for the first time of the need for people to use uh, latrines in the fields because there was absolutely nothing else. Uh, we were piled together in the cattle train in a very uncomfortable manner. Uh, I recall one traumatic incident where one of the doors of the train was open and my late grandfather, where I, I should mention that in addition to my nuclear family, father, mother, uh, two siblings, a brother and a sister, my late father uh, was able to get the entire Stern family onto that group. So there were five brothers of his with their families. The total Stern group was 32 members of the Kastner group, including my grandfather and grandmother. So to come back to grandfather, he was uh, on a very hot day as the train was making its way to Germany, sitting with his feet outside the train and riding when suddenly I hear a commotion 
and they wanted to keep him back. He was about to jump. Oh, that I recall distinctly. Uh, but anyway, he didn't. He survived. I come back to grandfather in Geneva in 1947, in just a few minutes. Uh, to come back to Bergen-Belsen, uh, I'll summarize my experiences as follows. My late father was a, uh, the head of one of the barracks. The barracks housed about 120 men each. The makeup of the Kessner train group was a very mixed makeup. Kessner was a secular Zionist from Korsice who organized the journey, but he needed money. And the money to bribe whoever needed to be bribed was collected from what I would say is the upper middle class Orthodox Jewish population of Budapest. So in the same barrack you would find, in our barrack, four what became world famous Rabbanim, the Satmar Rabbi Rabbi Oyer Zeitelbaum, and um, uh, the Rab of Debrecen, Rabbi Strasser, and Rabbi Jungreis, the father of the famous, now late, Rebetzin Jungreis, who was a girl my age, she was a girl of nine in the ladies' barrack, when I was in the men's barrack, and Rabbi uh, Jonathan Steif, who was a dyan in Budapest and became a dyan subsequently in Williamsburg in New York. So on the one hand you had this very right-wing religious element, and you had a totally secular, for lack of a better definition, left-wing left -wing, uh, element. How did it become problematic? Because everyone had to have his Toranut, his obligations of cleaning, not only the barrack, but also the latrines. And clearly my father wouldn't allow the Rabonim to have to do that job, something which upset the secular Jews very much. And there was an incident, which I didn't see, but my late mother told me about it a number of times, where one of the secular Jews went with a knife against my father, saying, if you will continue to like discriminate in this manner, uh, you know. So my father found a solution, which was to appoint an alter ego for the Rabbanim who wouldn't do the Toranot, and my late brother, Alfred Avron, became the alter ego for the Toranot, of the Satmar Rabbi, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, and that created between them a lifelong uh, bond which continued in America when brother would go to him very often. We were not Satmar Hasidim, but uh, it established a bond. Anyway, my recollection as a child, we were in Bergen-Belsen from July 3rd or 4th, I think, when we arrived, until uh, mid-December when uh, the second train took us to St. Gallen, Switzerland. I say the second train because the first train left already at the end of August and had about 300 mostly children on the train. My late father, uh, the first train left following the visit of a German Nazi officer called Krumaya who was one of Himmler's assistants in Budapest. And my father approached Krumaya in Bergen-Belsen, reminded him that Krumaya had promised him in Budapest his assistance if needed, and he said, could we please be part of the first train? I mean, first we didn't know he was the first or second of the train. And Krumaya asked him, how many members of your family are there? And father answered, 32. And Krumaya gave him a big slap in the face. And mother tells me that father became gray on that day after that slap in the face. Anyway, we didn't go on that train. We went on the main train, which left, as I say, mid-December. Everyone left on that train, bar, I recall, about eight people who did not have passports. They were stateless, and they were left behind. But otherwise, the entire Kastner group made it to Switzerland on the fifth day of Hanukkah, 1944. Uh, we were taken to a quarantine camp in a hotel 
uh, used to be a hotel, it now was converted into a camp in Caux sur Montreux, Caux is C A U X. It's a little village, skiing village above Montreux in Switzerland, where the first ones to be liberated and allowed to live in the city was Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, the Satmar Rebbe, who was told you can choose, I think, two other families to come at the same time. And my late father's family was one of the two. So we came to Geneva, and I remember distinctly my first day in Geneva, which was Tanit Esther 1945, because we arrived in the morning and I went to listen to the Megillah that evening. But what I recall distinctly was not the reading of the Megillah or the Shul, but the fact of, at the time, the Agudas Achim Orthodox Shul was located in Rue du Rhône, next to the department store called Grand Passage. And it is, for those who know Geneva, in the center of the city, next to the Place Mollard. Place Mollard is a very nice shopping uh, place in the city center. And I, who had come from a concentration camp, I remember just my amazement of seeing shops where people could go in and buy things and circulate and didn't have to report or to, to be afraid of anything. It was my first taste of freedom. And uh, the impressions remained with me all my life. Uh, subsequent history you want to know also? Can I just ask, um, when you were near Montreux, did you ever come into contact with Reche Sternberg? Or the Sternberg um, family? My father did. I, I was a kid. Yeah, yeah we knew Reche Sternberg. Very much so. I remember very much when we arrived to Montreux on the train, I remember a delegation of Jewish people headed by her welcoming us and giving, I think, sweets to the children or something. Very much so. Very much so. And just with regard to the Kassna train, which is when they had the they had the trial, the Kassna trial, did they ask your family to No. Uh, no. no. To give evidence or No, no, my father was not involved in that at all. Uh, the reproach made to Kastner was that he failed to inform Hungarian Jewry yeah. of the horrors of the concentration camps and the mass killings that were going on and he made it sound all very nice and sweet and thereby prevented or was instrumental in preventing what could otherwise have been, I don't know, a Warsaw ghetto type of rebellion. That is a basic reproach. Um, my attitude and was purely to say that in Jewish history, uh, when situations of life or death arose, Rabbanim of 2,000 years ago took steps which subsequently were judged by Chachomeinu Zichronam Livracha as having been the wrong step, specifically when Jerusalem was under siege and uh, Rabban Gamliel was able to escape and see Vespasian. This is a story related in the Talmud. Uh, because he impressed very much Vespasian, uh, he was told you can have one wish. And he asked for Yavne Bechachomeha to save Yavne and its scholars. And the question why not is Jerusalem? posed why not Jerusalem and let us off this time? And uh, the Gemara condemned Rabban Gamliel by saying that it was said of him, Meshiv Chachamim Achor Vidatam Yasakel, that clever people sometimes lose their cleverness and do things which are silly. Uh, yet, that's what happened in Jewish history. What I'm really saying is, it's easy to use hindsight and say you should have done this or that. Uh, I am not fit to emit a judgment, A, because my life clearly was saved as a result of being part of that train, but B, because I don't know what 
others would have done in their place. Uh, I think Katzna tried to save as many Jews as he could. Whether he could have acted differently, the Almighty alone knows. I have nothing much to contribute on that. Uh, what I will add, just to add to the to the post-traumatic effect, which are the modern word for the effect which uh, traumatic events can have, I will relate just a couple of consequences of our stay in Bergen-Belsen. The first story goes back to my late grandfather, 1947. We all live in Geneva, normal lives. I go to school. My late father is in business. And I visit with my grandparents, and my parents and we visit with my grandparents. And I suddenly see in the lounge, grandfather going to a cupboard in which there is food. And I couldn't understand why there was food in a cupboard when there was a kitchen there. And I found out that the hunger which he had suffered made him after the war, hoard food within his own home. He wouldn't just trust the availability of food in the kitchen, although it was his daughter and son who were in charge of the household, but he had to have his own little hoard. I personally have a little story to tell, and you, Mr. Glassman, saw me drink coffee mm -hmm. and jam, right. which is unusual. And Great. that story of the jam goes back to Bergen-Belsen. I will explain to you why. Because uh, my late mother, the Khanadi Bracha, would be in the woman's barrack. And she would, on the very thin piece of black bread which we had, prepare a sandwich or put some butter on it and jam and ask me to take it to my father. But I was hungry and I was tempted, so I licked off the jam and then spread the rest of it thinner and it left me with a complex of theft all my life. I was stealing jam from my father and I retained a craving for jam, which today, I mean, 84 years old, makes me Instead of sugar, I have jam with my coffee. And you've kept this tradition to this very day? That goes back to Bergen Belsen. These are small, seemingly silly uh, effects. Right. Um, I just went to. Uh, that is unbelievable and it's a nice. Uh, you want to know here about Kaufman a little bit? One. <laughs> wow. Mr. Williamson, it is the greatest honor and the privilege to to meet you and to hear Nissin, to hear this. It's unbelievable, it really is. It's such a cupboard and I'm so grateful. And from the bottom of my heart, really, thank you so very much. You should just have muzzle and brocha thank and you very good much. health. Amen, thank you. And thank you very, very much. And you should continue your good work. Thank you so much. <coughs>